And uh, the scriptures, it's good to walk by every day. We encounter these people, so see if you can identify them as the scriptures we read. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and the only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up their treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Mary, they were all waiting. So be it. <laughs> what was Brent's sermon title? Don't look back. Mine's entitled Looking Back to See Forward. <laughs> so you have to see what that means. The songs kind of summed it up too. I mean, we've got so many reasons to worship God because He is so loving and kind. We deserve eternal punishment, but instead He offers us grace, hope that we can never imagine, joy that we can never understand without knowing Jesus as our Savior. And then on top of that, we get salvation for our souls for all eternity. Where there is no suffering, no pain, every tear will be wiped away. What a wonderful reason to celebrate, to worship, because Jesus is our all in all. So I'm going to pray as, Timoth as Paul wrote those words to Timothy that we do fight the good fight, that we gather together as one body and use our spiritual gifts and talents to build each other up, not tear each other apart, that we are the body of Christ to this world, that we are a light to this world so that they see God's love living through us. So Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that Jesus did not leave us as orphans even after he faced the, the cross and that he rose again and continued to teach, but he sent the Spirit back to enable us to fight this good fight. Help us to realize that it, our life is not our own, that we were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and that we have a mission, an obligation to be a light to this world, to live out God's will that we were designed to in the very first place, the breath that we were given of life to do but even so much more because of the many reasons, 10,000 plus, that Jesus laid down His life for us. May we bind ourselves together so that we bring glory and honor to You, especially renewing that for this upcoming year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you look at your bulletins, I spend a lot of time, whether you realize it or not, trying to pick out these pictures and stuff so they match. And the one on the left says that any fear, I don't care if it's fear or not, whatever reason it is, a lot of times it boils down to fear. Even if it's jealousy or whatever, you fear what you won't have if, if you give those things up for God. But any fear of giving to God's kingdom is flawed. It's a lie. It's from the devil. It would be like a farmer who feared losing his bucket of seeds, so he failed to plant his own field, and thus forfeited the joy of overfilling his barns with harvest. I can think of so many verses to back that up, where we're supposed to plant the seed that has been given to us, the Word of God, the, the, the Jesus living in and through us, so that we can have a harvest. Who here would not want to have a harvest, especially of souls of your children and grandchildren? That right alone is one motivational reason that, that should keep all of us from leading a life astray or leading a life of, of self-interest and self-desire. I want my children and grandchildren to know Jesus Christ, the joy that He will give them in this world. 
the answer to the pain and the suffering and everything else, and then to know that they'll spend eternity in heaven with me. If you came Christmas Eve, you'll know that I read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. Verses 17 through 20 is what I want to read today. That was my final point. After seeing him, after seeing a baby, the shepherds told everyone what happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all of these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So I made four points quickly at the end to stimulate you. After seeing with your own eyes, after experiencing what Jesus Christ has done for you, if you realize that, then you have to tell everyone. And everyone will be amazed if your words match your behavior. They won't be if you're not. They'll call you a hypocrite, a viper, a liar. But if you live what you say and you have the joy and the peace that surpasses all understanding because you've seen for yourself what Jesus will do, you'll tell everyone and they'll be amazed. And they'll have to ponder in their heart whether this is true or not. They'll have to decide what they need to do with Jesus Christ. As you ponder it in your heart and you examine the many, many reasons that you should give up your life to serve Jesus. And then the shepherds went back to their same occupation. They didn't leave their flocks behind. And they worshipped and praised God. Where they were called to be, they didn't worry about that they were just shepherds, lowly shepherds, anything else. They didn't think they were any greater than because the angels had told them. They just went back and worshipped and praised God while they were doing the job and calling that He gave them. Let that be a pattern for us. Now this week happens to not be the busiest shopping week of the year. What is it? It's the busiest return week of the year. Isn't that ironic? But it's not ironic. Because after the greatest gift ever given to man, so many people will not use it. So they might as well return it. Because all the things that Jesus did to them, they'll go away from Christmas with these loving feelings and stuff, and before January 1st, they won't use it at all. Or maybe they'll make New Year's resolutions and they'll use it for a little while, but then they'll shove it aside again. Maybe they'll go to church regularly and everything else, but instead of using words to build up one another, they use words to tear down one another. Instead of using their gifts to serve one another, they use gifts whenever and however they desire. That's not God's plan. It's not why Jesus gave up His life. It's not what He continued on this earth until He ascended to preach to them. It's not the power of God that came down like flaming tongues from heaven and em empowered them. That's not the reason that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. So I hope you think about all the gifts being returned and think about the gift that was given you and how precious it is and how you should use it. You're given eternal salvation. You're given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, as Scripture says so that you can share that and you can invite others and you can show them the way. If you're not going to use it, return it. Maybe that sounds harsh, but if you read through the New Testament, which you should have been doing right now, that's exactly what the letter's written are. James says, I don't believe you because your actions aren't showing it. You've been exiled from your own home and everything, but yet you're backbiting each other with that little tongue. You say you love God and you're tearing down your brother and sister. So if it's not edifying, James says, don't say it. <laughs> Pretty simple. If it's not helpful to build them up, then you, maybe you didn't need to say it. And if you got through reading this week, you just read Hebrews. And you see the account tying everything together in the Old Testament. This looking back to see forward looking back at the mistakes the Israelites made, how unfaithful they were to God, but how loving and faithful God was to them. Even to the point that what He promised for many, many years, it seemed like would never happen at the darkest time in all history, there was light that came into the world. It became flesh and blood. Jesus born a little bitty baby. Most of you have seen newborn babies. Oh, they're cute, especially to the mother and father. To the rest of us, they're like, ooh. <laughs> They're not that lovely to look at. They're precious because of what they 
are. These shepherds went and saw this little newborn baby and were amazed that God would love the world so much that He would send His own Son in flesh and blood. Not knowing that, that this child would grow up to give up His own life to save us. They had no idea of that. So in Hebrews, it starts out this way in chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, that was what he, that they said then, and it's what's still true today and even more so, because we are approaching the time when Jesus Christ will return, His second advent, His second coming. Now in these final days, He has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to, to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son He created the universe, the one who was there in the beginning, who will be there in the, in the end, who is forever. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. This is who Jesus is. And when He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. So now I want to ask you this question. Why did Jesus go to heaven? Why are we still here on earth? Because we have a job to do. And Jesus went to prepare a place for us, correct? We're in that time frame right now. Jesus is preparing our home for us. We are here as His ambassadors, as Paul says. His hands and feet, the body of Christ, telling the gospel message, this same good news that the shepherds were told. By angels, we have that privilege to do that until He returns to carry us home. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, not your time frame, God's time frame, when we've reached the last person, whatever the, whatever, however you want to look at it, when the right time has come, everything is ready, Jesus said, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. What a promise. <laughs> One of 10,000 reasons, plus, 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 to worship God, to thank Him, to rejoice even in sufferings, whatever it is, to give praise and glory to God with the breath of life that you still have in your body. What a hope that we have. What a joy. So what about in the meantime? If you read on in John chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, I tell you the truth which means listen up, okay? Anyone who believes in me, anyone, will do the same works I have done. Wow. Same things as Jesus did. Oh, that's not, he's not finished. It says, and even greater works will you do. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. I've put you in charge of the Father's goods. You always were, but you sinned and fell short of God's glory. But now I'm sending the Holy Spirit to empower you even more to do the job that you were created to do. That you will do even greater things. You have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You have the power that walked Jesus through His life and even raised Him from the dead living inside of you. You are, as Peter says, priests, a group of priests, a royal priesthood. The priest was the one who had access to God the people had to go through. You and I are priests now. We bring access to God to those who do not know Him by telling them and by living a life that shows we believe what we say. And don't forget, He's gone to the Father to prepare your home. Verse 13, You can ask for anything in My name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. But how many times do we not have that faith? Verse 15, if you love me. If, that's a big word there, just two letters, but it's huge. If you love me, then obey my commandments. Do this. Jesus is saying, if you obey me, then do this. But we'll read on and see if what he says further. If you do that, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive Him because it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him. But you know Him 
because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Now I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Before he said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now Jesus is qualifying that and says, if you accept them, what I'm telling you, and you obey them, then you are the ones who love me. Put those two together. So are you obeying? Have you accepted Jesus' command? Are you living the life that you should? If you can think of anything that I'm just saying right now where you're not doing that, then that needs to be your New Year's resolution. You don't do it anymore. You need to do it today, right now. You don't even need to wait till New Year's. Because anything that has just come to your mind is not what came to me, not what came to you, but what God already knows. And He wants to take that from you. It is one of the 10,000 reasons that Jesus died for you again. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. You having troubles reading your Bible and everything? Right there, Jesus says, if you love me, if you obey my commandments, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. You will learn more and more about Jesus who is God. Nothing will be hidden from you. Verse 22, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. We hear it again. My Father will love them and He will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. Boy, He said it every which way that I can think of to make it clear for us. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. So they're not just Jesus' words, they're God's words. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything. And He will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift. Now, a gift is only as good, I said it before, as how you use it. That's why there are so many returns this time of year. Because guess what? You might have picked out what you thought was the best gift in the world for that person, but they didn't want it. I don't know what reason, but they didn't really care about the gift you gave them. Now, I don't say that to make you mad at anybody else, anything else. I say that to make you think about the gift that God has given you. It does no good if you don't use it. Especially in this case, if you use it, if you die to yourself, take up your cross and follow after Jesus, then you're reaping a harvest of souls for all eternity. Why would I ever let anything stop me from using that gift? Verse 27, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, no matter how hard you try to seek it in so many created things. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I have told you. I am going away, remember, to prepare your home for you, but I will come back to you again and take you to heaven instead of hell. Now, I threw that in there. It's not in there. But that's what it's implying. So back to Hebrews. We look, read a couple verses from chapter 1. one. Chapter 2 starts this way. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. That's why we meet together, which he'll go on to say in Hebrews. That's why we try to spur one another. That's why we are tied together as one body. A body in pieces is not a functional body. A body that is tied together and working, listening to the head, is a functional body. It can get its purpose done. In chapter 3, it starts this way, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. Think very carefully about this. Now, Mike's not here today, but he preached about the Sabbath. 
and keeping it holy. But he didn't get into what the Sabbath really is. The author of Hebrews does. In verse 7 of chapter 3, he starts, That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today when you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There are your ancestors tested and tried my patience, and even though they saw my miracles for 40 years, so I was angry with them and said, Their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God rested from His work, not because He needed to, but to tell us of the rest that He would give us in this world, but so much more the rest we would have for all eternity. What is rest from? Our work. What is our work in Jesus Christ but to be His hands and feet until He returns? So if you're not doing that, you're not working towards the kingdom. Your works of righteousness don't save you, but as James says, your faith proved by your actions shows that you are. So you should be working for the kingdom now, not working for a boat <laughs> or whatever it is. Your heavenly Father knows you need those things and will supply those things, not necessarily a boat. But you should be working for the kingdom your life was ransomed. It was purchased with a price. God's only Son. This new covenant, this new promise is written in the blood of Jesus Christ. They will never enter my place of rest. Then we have the example. Joshua did finally lead them into the promised land, but it was temporary, wasn't it? Our home in heaven is not temporary. We don't have to go fight the giants still because they've already been defeated. On the cross, Jesus said, Satan has no power anymore. No power over your destination. No power over your life now. Jesus took all that away from him. If you read on in Hebrews chapter 3, the next verse, Be careful then... Dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving. He's saying, remember what the children of Israel did in the wilderness so that you don't do the same thing. Looking back to see forward so we don't make those mistakes. <clears throat> make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God, even though you proclaim to be a Christian. You must warn each other every single day while it is still today, while you're still in this mission field, this place that is not your home, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if, you, if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as we did when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Wait a minute. What? Christ has everything. We've already read that scripture. Everything belongs to Him. And we will share in it? Wow. Remember what it says, verse 15. Today, when you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God even though they heard His voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? Just as Jesus Christ led us out of this world to be aliens, to be ambassadors for Him. And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when He took an oath that, that they would never enter His rest? The reason we are to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Wasn't it the people who disobeyed Him? So we see that because of their unbelief, if you asked any one of them if they believed, what would they say? Yes, I believe. I am an Israelite. I am a Jew. I am a child of God. But because of their unbelief, their words didn't mean anything, did they? They were not able to enter His rest. 
John 14, verse 12, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me, the opposite of unbelief, will do the same works I do. I quote that instead of another verse so that you can see. I'm not talking about the destination. I'm talking about the work that we have until we reach the destination. In Hebrews chapter 4, it starts out this way. God's promise of entering His rest still stands. He wasn't talking about the promised land. He was talking about the promised land. <laughs> the one that Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Since His promise still stands, we ought to tremble with fear. Tremble with fear. Why? That some of you might fail to experience it. The author of Hebrews, whoever he is, I like to think he's Barnabas. I just, that's what I like, whether you believe it or not. Because Barnabas was named Barnabas. It's not his given name. Because the disciples themselves said he was encouraging. He was the son of encouragement, which is what Barnabas means. And since we don't know who the letter of Hebrews is, I like to say it's Barnabas. Because he's the one that went and found Saul and said, Hey, look, these guys in Antioch, they're acting like Christ. The world is calling them Christians. They're not calling them that in a good thing. They're being derogatory about it. But I want you, Saul, to know that they're doing this. I'm so excited that they are. They realize that they're set apart and holy and they act so different from the world that the world sees it with their own eyes. They're amazed. They talk about it. They have to ponder in their heart all the things that we heard on the original Christmas story. Hebrews 4 said, God's promise of entering His rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Verse 2, for this good news, yours might say gospel, the same message, the message of Jesus doesn't change. For unto you this day a Savior is born in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. This good news that God has prepared this rest, this Sabbath rest, they're tying the story together, has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did them no good because they didn't share the faith, the belief of those who what? Listened to God. So how are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? Well, Jesus was clear about that again. So let's go back to His words. In Luke 9.23, this is from Mark, but you'll recognize. If anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Then you must take up your cross daily and then follow me. If you're trying to hang on to your life, you will lose it. If you're trying to hang on to this life, you will lose eternal life. But if you give up this life for my sake, you will save it for all eternity. Verse 25, And what do you benefit if you gain this whole world today, but you yourself are lost or destroyed for all eternity? That's the Allen abridged version. But that's what Jesus meant. Why would you not want to be my follower? If you say you do, if you believe that, then you will do these things. Even greater works than I did, you will do for the kingdom. He went on to say in verse 57, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay His head. That was verse 58. He said that in response to verse 57. As they were walking, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus was saying, really? Kind of like James said, you will? I don't have a home. Will you give it up for me? Verse 59, another person said, he said to another person, come follow me. And the man agreed. But, there's that word, he said, first let me return home and bury my father. And you might think that sounds like a legitimate excuse at first, but if you study, he meant let me go home until my father dies. It's not in my timing yet. 
And Jesus answered, Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. You've been called. It's time to serve. You can't give me an excuse and say, I'll do it on my own terms, on my own time frame. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Your duty. Verse 61, Another one said, Yes, Lord, I will follow you. But... First, let me just go back and say bye to my family. Don't let me have a bunch of time. I just need to go back right now and have a day to say goodbye. And Jesus' answer to him was, Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and starts plowing, accepts this commission to be his disciple, his follower, believer, and then looks back at the world, is not fit for the kingdom of God. That's harsh. All I want to do is go say goodbye to my family. And Jesus is saying, what I'm giving you is worth so much more and God will take care of your family. Trust in me. I never said you couldn't go back. But put your hand to the plow and start plowing. Planting those seed, being my workman, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know that verse, don't you? Everybody know that verse kind of, sort of? Do you know the verses prior to it? No, you don't. <laughs> we'll go over that in a second. <laughs> God's promise of rest stands. I stopped in verse 3 before. I'm going to read Hebrews 4, 4 through uh, 14. As for the others, God said, In my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place to rest. Even though this rest has been ready since He made the world. It's just something God always planned. We know it's ready because of the place in Scripture where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all His work. See it tied all together? This has been a thought from the beginning of time because God knows everything and is in control of everything. Verse 5, But in another passage it says, They will never enter my place of rest. We have a quandary, don't we? But Jesus fixes that. Verse 6, So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news, this gospel message even back then, failed to enter because they disobeyed God. They said, I believe, but their actions didn't prove it. Verse 7, so God set another time for entering His rest, and that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted, Today when you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts. Verse 8, now if Joshua had succeeded in giving them rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. Praise be to God that Jesus is preparing our home. Wow! Verse 10, For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. Verse 11, So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, if we don't follow after Jesus' commands, which I've already read, that Jesus said, If you love me, you will, and if you're following your commands, that proves that you are. If we disobey God as the people of Israel did, looking at their example from the Old Testament, we will fall. Now listen carefully to the next verse. It begins with a prepositional phrase, so it's tying together what's just said. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. If you're not reading, how is it alive and powerful in you? I told you I was going to keep on all year. <laughs> If you're not reading your Bible, it can't be alive and powerful in you. And last year I set apart a plan so we would all read together. So that when then you went over to somebody's house, there would be a question that comes up. It would. It just would. It's going to happen that way. You know what we read about this week? What did you think about that? So then that you're talking and studying about it, about it and everything else. But it won't happen. It won't be alive and powerful if you're not reading it. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, which you can't even define that, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He is the one to whom we are accountable." It just said previous to that, reading His Word. I know the word there wasn't reading, wasn't found, but it's implied. I can't get it by holding it. 
I can't get it sitting on a shelf having 10 different copies of it. I get it by reading it. The Word of God is alive, active, powerful. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It is the Word made flesh and living among us. <clears throat> so then, verse 14, we have a great high priest who has entered heaven to prepare that place for us. He is Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold firmly to what we believe. In the next chapter, chapter 5, the author writes, There is much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, uh-oh, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. I'm going to point the finger this way. Not that way. Yes, I am. I'm spiritually dull because I fail to listen. I fail to experience the joy and the peace that I should have because I fail to listen. If my business goes down, I worry about trying to get that business back up. I don't look back at that verse that says God will provide for me Don't to cast my fear and anxiety on Him and take the yoke of Jesus upon so I have to go back to this word every single day. I pray every single day so that I do thank Him for everything I have, even when business is down, even when I don't have it at all, if that's what it may be, whatever it is. And I know that He'll provide for me, and I know that it doesn't change the task that Jesus set for me written in His blood. That I need to trust Him and lean not unto my own understanding and to walk by faith, not by sight, because it's what I'll tend to do. And I need you to be tied together with me, going on the same journey, building me up instead of tearing me down, and vice versa. That's why I said I'd point the finger at me. Verse 12 of chapter 5 says, You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. In chapter 6, the author writes the very first words, So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. We should be much further than that as a church. We should be mature. I've said it before, what child does not want to grow up? That's why they have the little dreams. Every girl has a dream of a princess. Every boy has a dream of an astronaut or a firefighter or whatever. When they grow up, don't you want to grow up in Christ? Who would not want to if, in fact, you believe? Fast forwarding to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately keep sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. For, got a prepositional phrase, anyone who refuses to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse punishment will be for those who have trampled the Son of God, who say they believe but don't love Him and don't follow His commandments, who say they'll be His disciples but I won't follow you here. And having treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, and who have insulted and disdain the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us, who lives inside of me. For, another preposition, 
We know the one who said, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. We like to use that verse for someone else. Oh, they done this. God will take his vengeance. I don't need to. That was written for us who disobey Christ and trample his gift as though it wasn't worthy. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 35, so don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. If you don't remember any other reason, remember heaven, what you're working towards. Not for, it's already been obtained, what you're working towards. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. For in just a little while the coming one will come and not delay, and my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no ple pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away for God, from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. We are springs of living water, free Methodist church. I'll put that in there. Woo -hoo. That takes me to Hebrews chapter 11, that hall of fame, where my motto verse is, and I hope you want to take it on. Verse 7, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family. Large boat takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. He took a lot of his life. He had to say to the rest of the world who said, you're nuts. He had to say, well, maybe for Jesus. He had to be obedient. We don't know how his family looked at him, anything else. But he took a large section of his life and he worked towards the salvation that God would give him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat. Why? To save his family from the flood. It is by faith that I'm going to live my life no matter what it takes to build a life by my example and my words that my children will see Jesus Christ and they will enter into his ark of salvation. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he did receive the righteousness that comes from faith. Next chapter starts out after this list of characters. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of, the joy, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Verse 14, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau. Another example we read from the Old Testament. Why would the author bring that up now? Because he traded his birthright. Don't trade God's gift of salvation for anything that in this earth. He traded his birthright as the firstborn for a single meal. We can look back at him and say, how stupid. He came in cold and hungry and said, I'll trade it for a meal. What will you trade following Jesus for? It will look just as stupid when you look back. Believe and follow after Jesus. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Verse 17, you know that afterward when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged for it with bitter tears. In chapter 13, verse 14, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice. You're going to mention that in a minute, aren't you? In closing, Debbie. Because <laughs> you picked out that verse. How would you pick out that verse? Except that God led her to pick out that verse about offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. Continually. It's our praise to God. Proclaiming our allegiance to His name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. 
These are the sacrifices that please God. Now look at your bulletins. I'm almost done. Look on the right hand side of the little picture. And it's a good little example for us again because we don't see it when we do it ourselves. There's two dogs, and the dogs are labeled mind. And she, if you, you said it right, Sherry, about the one dog, he should look sickly or whatever. Jacob was. Okay. The little dog in the garbage, he doesn't look sickly or nothing. Why? Because if you look at this world by sight, you'll look at all the people who are doing all these bad things, and it's all through the Old Testament again. David wrote many psalms about it, and you'll say, why are they living such a good life now? Well, their reward is coming. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we look at that and say, what in the world would the dog be eating out of the garbage? Why would his owner let him do that? Well, the owner didn't let him do it. He's telling him to stop if you look at it. And the garbage is listed as Satan's lies. The captions read are, oh no, how many times have I told you to stay out of that garbage? That's what he tells the dog. The other guy says you have to keep it on a leash. Two dogs, two masters, but the thing that keeps the one tied to following the right path is the leash. What does the leash say above it? Can you read it? That's why I'm reading it for you. It says it's the Word of God. If you read this word regularly, if you develop it in your home as a pattern, if you write it on the doorpost of your home like it says, if you talk about it when you get up and when you go to bed, your probabilities are a lot better that you'll see your children in heaven and your grandchildren in heaven and their grandchildren in heaven. Wow! So we got a new reading plan. I call it this. If it's offensive, good. <laughs> Take it to the cross. <laughs> Meat, milk, or no nourishment at all. Milk, just simply read the five by five plan that I've got outlined for you. Five minutes, not 15 or 20. I know that that was too hard. It was tough. I'm not saying it about you. It was tough. It was tough for me. I'm behind right now. I'm five days behind, but I'm going to get caught up. Because of the holidays. That means that I got, oh, an hour and a half to catch up plus the reading each day. It's tough. It's not when we look at it, really. It's not. But it's tough. So I'm telling you to do five minutes. Five minutes, you read one chapter in the New Testament. If on the back of that you look, you've got January's outline for you. You do that for the five weekdays. You take notes. It tells you five ways to increase your thought process. And then on Saturday and Sunday, you reflect back on what you read. Five minutes every day. That's it. But you'll get in a pattern, and you'll read through the New Testament in the year of 2020. If you won't meet, then go read further than that, and I'll tell you more about that. And part of the way is to read this. And I've got several copies, but I don't know how many, and I'll give a copy to everyone who wants one but I might have to reorder some. This is a daily devotional, so I would be reading this on top. And January 1st happens to be the Christian's call to courage. Starts out this way, there are so many who profess Christ and so few who are in fact Christians. So many who go into the field against Satan and so few who come out conquerors. All may have a desire to be successful soldiers, but few have the courage and determination to grapple with the difficulties that have cost them on the way to victory. All Israel followed Moses joyfully out of Egypt, but when their stomachs were a little pinched with hunger, same things we just read about, and their immediate desires deferred, they were ready to once retreat. They preferred the bondage of Pharaoh to the promises of Promise blessings of God. How many times do we do that? I'll give you a copy today so you'll have it for January 1st. So that's part of your meat plan. Then your third plan was no nourishment at all. I hope that's none of us. If you have a child and you don't feed them at all, what happens? They die. And Scripture's clear about that. 
If you don't read God's Word, then when Satan comes to you, just as he did to Jesus in the wilderness, you'll be trying to live on bread, man's bread alone. And you will not be able to fight him away. He came as a thief to kill, steal, and destroy. To rob your inheritance. To make your life worthless. If you don't recognize those words, those are Jesus' words, paraphrased. Read them. Now I have one more thing to say. If you're going to commit to it, sign it. Take that bulletin on that calendar and sign your name to it so that you see it and you commit to reading in January. I promise you that February will be even easier. I promise you that March, you'll be desiring it. I promise you by April, you'll be telling others about it because that's how God works. His Word is alive, living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If you post it on the door frames of your house, your children will most likely follow in the faith that you say you do because they will be seeing it in their lives. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. As we are approaching a new year and we think about resolutions to make and everything else, let us think more and more about our relationship with you through the precious gift that Jesus Christ gave us. Let us not get too far from Christmas to realize the precious gift that Jesus gave by giving up His life. And what do I have to offer except to give my life back as a sweet-smelling sacrifice in return for the one who loved me enough to give His life for me? Father, my prayer as a church is to bind us together with Your Spirit to be an effective body to this Jerusalem to Bonner's Ferry, then to outskirts of Judea and Samaria, and then to the utter ends of the earth. I pray that Satan has no hold here because I know that he doesn't. The only hold he has is in the lack of our knowledge of the truth. So may we read your word to study, to be an approved workman that rightly handles the word of truth. May we bring you glory and honor as we await Jesus' return. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.